I'm Heida Rosenmaltenwelfer and I'm doing the experiments in this project. And yeah, so, um, so last paper before lunch, we need to make this very, very super exciting. So here goes. Um, inscribed textiles found in Egypt, um, dating from the late antique and the early Islamic periods, provide important cultural and documentary evidence in the form of movable personal objects. After the Arab conquest of Egypt, uh, markings on cloth uh, expanded official control of the textile industry. Taraz originally referred to a type of embroidered band, but over time the term evolved to become a more generic designation for messages on cloth. And among the artifacts recovered from Upper and Middle Egypt burials, a small but important group of textiles demonstrates the intersections of religious cultures in post-conquest Egypt. So in this presentation, we'll show how interdisciplinary research methods are necessary to um, interpret uh, these complex artifacts that represent a synthesis of both late antique and Arab cultures to create a distinctive form of Christian Taraz as a means to convey prayers and blessings. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, hundreds, as we know, hundreds of these so-called Coptic textiles flowed into collections around the world through the antiquities market, um, totally divorced from their context. Um, so subsequently, um, the information content on these is generally pretty low. So what we were going for is trying to maximize the information content that we could start with to get to significance, to bring this material to the uh, attention of scholarship. So today we've gathered data for more than 200 Greek and Coptic inscribed textiles in over 40 collections, and there are certainly more to be found. Uh, the University of Michigan collection is especially noteworthy because it was created as a textile analog to the Papyrus Museum there. And note that this study um, excludes inscriptions that were written or painted on cloth. What we're trying to understand is the interaction between the medium and the, the content um, when rendered in cloth. Um, inscribed textiles fall into distinctive categories, um, which I'll just give a, a very brief um, uh, overview of. The most widely known Greek um, inscribed textiles are tapestry hangings where text provides a label for key figures. So in this example, Dionysus is on the left and uh, figures of Paris uh, and Athena in the middle with the Virgin Mary flanked by Michael and Gabriel on the left, on the, um, on the right rather. And dating for this evidence um, is presented at the bottom of the slide. So um, after the Arab conquest of Egypt, inscribed Christian-themed tunic ornaments appear, and their form represents um, a very major shift in Christian representation that continued into the 10th century. Um, and the conspicuous use of religious representation dominated by Old Testament themes, such as the Joseph uh, group of tapestries um, is presented here. And consistent with papyrological evidence, uh, Coptic entirely supplanted Greek as the language of inscription on cloth. And the interaction with Islamic culture is evident by the choice of Indian lac as the red dye stuff. And this particular dye stuff is never seen in textiles um, pre-conquest. So when Tiraz emerged in Arab culture in the 8th century, we also see the form of Christian inscriptions involved um, from labeling represented figures to more elaborated inscriptions in Coptic script with more decorative designs. So the, this group of cloths is attributed to workshops in the Fayoum region. Um, but few cloths with elaborated Coptic inscriptions have been carbon dated. Um, now, given the, uh, given the size of the corpus, um, the most expensive, the most extensive text is found on inscribed funerary shrouds which is the focus of the remainder of this presentation with about 45 um, examples in the corpus. Um, names and blessings on inscribed gar garments and household item and items serve as poignant appeals on behalf of loved ones. And collectively, these cloths demonstrate the commingling of religious messages and imagery on cloth. 
Rather than trying to discuss the entire body of the fragments, we will discuss this group through a case study of an unpublished shroud from the Kelsey Museum at the University of Michigan, number 88017A and P, as shown on the left. The diagram in the center describes our interdisciplinary research methods that bring scholars in reality, real, uh, related fields together for non-invasive analysis and sampling, including dye analysis and car the radiocarbon dating. This is a working process. We want to share research today and show direction for a larger, fully founded project to study and publish this corpus. Our current focus is non-invasive analysis that brings textual scholars, historians, technical anal textile analysis and experimental archaeology together. The evidence suggests that this artifact was the product of a professional industry that produced luxury funerary fraud for the Christian market. This slide provides an overview of the fraud fragments. The body flues shows The body flu shows that the clothes was used as infernary reeds. The surviving fragment, uh, the two ends of a shroud, both selfages survived with a wide of 150 centimeters and 80 centimeters high, and the center of the section is lost. The length is by reference of the one of the few intact pieces from another collection. The center wrapping section was probably a plain reef. Three elaborated lines of text survived in readable form, making this an extremely important document for historical analysis. So the text um, is written in a Fayumic Sahidic dialect of Coptic. Uh, the B fragment contains a personal prayer and benediction, which is shown by the green line um, that begins uh, on the left side and continues to about three quarters of the way to the right. Um, and this uh, text is shown above um, in two sections um, along with the Coptic reading. And so the translation is, Lord Jesus Christ, our true God, bless, help, and protect the life of our servant, Cicinios, the priest, son of your servant, the deacon, Humisi, the carpenter. Amen, it shall be. And the text is readable, but there are several errors in the inscription. For example, as shown in the red box, the letter Rho is reversed. So uh, the A fragment is shown above the B piece on this slide, and the text in the two lines that appear above, showing the particular sections of the psalm, um, this is Psalm 22, um, starts on the right side of line one, so right here on the right side of line, line one of the B fragment, and continues um, with two lines on the A fragment, progressing upward. And the psalm begins with the message, the Lord tends me as a shepherd. So the embellished letter forms are interesting and unusual within the corpus of similar fragments, um, which may show the influence of um, Arabic uh, aesthetic, or more likely it's carried over from the Coptic manuscript tradition, which uses similar colors and letter forms. <clears throat> this type of shroud is really a prestige product, loaded with details of provided plink as a form of conspicuous consumption. There are five registers of brocaded silk on this fragment. This image has been edited to make the white silk more visible. The magnified image of the silk brocading wefts is shown on the left, and the higher magnification image on the right shows that the construction of the brocading wefts is unusual. The wefts are inserted into the same sheet as the Derby Crown Reef. The design program is symmetrical for both ends of the shroud, with additional embellishment so stripes and embroidered ornaments. We spe see specific protection conventions for embroidered figures. The red arrows show the starting and the finishing yarns. 
They are twisted together and are long rather than knotted. These long yarns are visible through the open weave on the right side. Note that the shrouds were clearly made for burial purpose. There are no signs of wear or rework. The high twist yarn appears new and well, well, very well preserved. Com Comparing the Kelsey fragment with a similar piece in the Papyrus Library collection in Vienna, we see that the embroidery techniques and conventions are very similar to the Kelsey fragments. Where is this coming from? It's that automatic voice. Oh, I see. <laughs> <laughs> but comparing the inscription side by side, we can mark difference in the epigraphy between the two fragments. The papyrus library piece on the left has more ornate style with ligatures on the letter forms. The most important point is that we see evidence of very different lettering styles, but they are both adapted to the constraints of the close medium and embroidery technique. Analysis of the new letters from all three lines of the Kelsey fragment shows a high degree of consistency in letter form and method of production. For example, the red arrows mark the intersection of the diagonal and vertical lines. The join above the bottom of the letters reflect a specific stylistic choice. For some letter forms, we see fairly consistent spacing with three or four webs between the letters, but we also see examples of kerning, which, in which spacing is adjusted for certain letters to give a more pleasing effect. This analysis indicates that the letter spacing was planned in advance of the production. We also see individual differences in the top member of the tau caused by the starting and the ending point of the embroidery. The red arrows show the tip caused by improper alignment of the stitches that would not be seen if written with a stylus. In summary, our analysis shows that three factors must be considered when analyzing textual inscriptions. Letter forms are adapted to the medium and the production method we see a clear standardization of letters with consistent stylistic forms, and the production method also influences letter forms as shown by the variations on the tau. Now turning to scientific analysis, we have the dye analysis results for the Vienna fragment with the same color as the Kelsey piece. The black yarn was dyed with wood or indigo, and likely an unknown dye source obtained to the deep black color. And the red yarn was dyed with a red lac dye, which is notable because it fits with the change of the dye stuffs to the Indian Ocean trade after the rubber conquest. So to tie, to tie together the um, elements of this case study, from a historical perspective, um, we see the centuries-long practice of text as labels for records uh, for um, representations was transformed into text-dominant textile artifacts embellished with decorations. We see from a cross-cultural influence standpoint that Christian use of text for uh, making religious meaning merged with the messaging role of Islamic inscription to create a distinctive form of Christian taraz. The inscribed prayers and blessings on cloth invoke God's protection as a, as a projection and a defense of religious identity for a culture that was under external pressure. Um, the technical analysis shows very clearly the uh, details of construction indicate that a professional industry existed to produce funerary shrouds for the Christian market. Experim experimental reproduction provides a basis for interpreting the series of decisions, including technology and work practices. Uh, scientific methods, of course, provide specific information for comparison with like artifacts and other aspects of the material culture. 
Um, rigorous analysis of complex objects, this is the point, provides um, the need for ongoing collaboration and interaction throughout the process, not just sort of parsing out roles and assignments, which help us to uh, interpret the interactions among various components. And as Karina mentioned, and uh, this is our thought too, we want to make sure to bring forward the contemporary relevance of this kind of research um, in that we see in the past and in the present projection of identity and beliefs through text on cloth provides insights into the contemporary culture of textile messages. So thank you. We are um, pursuing this as a research project. Um, and if any of you have stumbled across ins inscribed um, textiles, Coptic inscribed textiles that fit this typology in your collections, please let us know. Um, they're relatively rare, but contain really valuable um, documentary information that should be published as a corpus. So thank you.